Good evening. Please stand with us.
stole my soul Why so disturbed within me I can remember when you showed your face to me As a dear plans for water so my soul longs for you And when I survey your splendor you so so disturbed within me I am satisfied in you Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them sit here while I go over there and pray He began to be sorrowful and troubled My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to hear my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles 
and my life draws near to death. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? Let's read together. But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? In the eyes of pain and sorrow, when the world brings no relief, when the eye is dim and heavy, and the heart oppressed with grief, while blessings free. Savior, Lord, we trust in Thee. When the snares of death surround us, pride, ambition, love of ease, money with her false allurements, words of flatter smiles that please before we.
his right hand, and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. For 
As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. 
In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma, lemai sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest.
Good evening, Sojourn East family. My name is Matthew Westerholm. I serve as an elder here at Sojourn East. My wife, Lisa, and I have been attending the church for almost five years. Feels like 20. One of those years was COVID. It's hard to know how to describe it, but we are spending this evening with a little bit of time in Genesis 22. Uh, We'll get there in a second. But this evening, we're joining Christians around the world in turning our attention to one of the most stunning events in human history, the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ. This is an event that is so stunning, it's hard to take in. It has inspired some of the greatest works of art in Western civilization. Uh, Michelangelo's Piata, uh, um, poetry like George Herbert's Uh, The Temple, uh, The Sacrifice, works of music. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote two um, um, passions, one about the Gospel of John, one about the Gospel of Matthew, using many of the texts that we were reading and going through tonight. This has inspired Christians for centuries. And in some ways, it's, it's almost too much to take in. It's almost too much to take in. Let me read you some lines from a poem by London pastor Frederick William Pitt, uh, a 19th century British pastor. I'll just pick a few of these lines from his poem called The Maker of the Universe. The maker of the universe as man for man was made a curse. Listen to some of these paradoxes. The nails that pierced his feet were mined in mountains that he designed. He made the forests where there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. And there's about 50 of these. Okay, there's such an incredible paradox here as we see what the Apostle Peter describes later in the book of Acts as the author of life be killed. Um, What an incredibly intense moment we're looking at and thinking about in seeing this maker of the universe unmade, seeing Christ's glorification and humiliation at the same time, his defeat and his victory together, his shame and glory, the ugliness and the beauty all at the same time. It's, It's a lot. It is a lot. In some ways, my, my analogy for us this evening is it's sort of like looking at a solar eclipse. It's, if you can't really stare at it directly without some specialized eye protection. And so God, in His grace, has given us some different ways to see what is happening at the cross of Christ. And we've looked at some of these passages. Our worship team has done such a great job of leading us through some of these psalms and passages in Isaiah. Uh, this evening, I'd like to take us through one of these passages. This is um, Genesis 22, where we are going to help look at the cross a little bit indirectly, but maybe by looking at it slightly obliquely, we'll be able to take more of it in, be able to understand more of it with our heads, be able to feel more of it with our hearts. It's glorious. It's stunning. This passage is going to fit our time very well. It's a passage that the Lord used to call me to ministry, actually, when I heard it preached by a man named James Montgomery Boyce many years ago. Uh, Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word as we read here? Genesis 22, 1 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, 
Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father... And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Let me pray for us. Lord, you are the light of all who know you. You are the joy of all who love you. You are the strength of all who serve you. Flood our minds with your light and our hearts with your joy so that we can serve you better. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Have a seat. Our passage here shows a beautiful two-movement pattern. Two movements that we see here that are the way things are supposed to work. This is how life is supposed to work. It's supposed to go like this. God commands, people obey. That's the way life is supposed to work. Watch for it in your Bibles. God commands, people obey. Very often, however, people don't obey when God commands. God commands Adam and Eve, eat anyway. God commands the Israelites, sin. God commands Jonah, flees. But people love this story that we just read because it's one of the best examples of this pattern being followed rightly. God commands, Abraham obeys. Even when the Lord gives one of the strangest commands in the entire Bible, Abraham obeys. Let's learn how to beautifully obey like Abraham. We're going to travel through both of these movements, God's command in verses 1 and 2 and Abraham's obedience in verses 3 through 14. Let's start with God's command. We hear God's command here in verses 1 and 2, and we're going to learn two things. First, notice how God's command interrupts Abraham's life. Starting in verse 1, it says, after these things. What things are being referenced here? Well, Genesis 21 kind of has three main stories in it. We have the birth of Isaac. We have the departure of, of Hagar and Ishmael. And then we have a treaty with Abimelech. And in many ways, these represent some of the brightest days in Abraham's life. It's a dream come true for Abraham. Genesis 21 is a dream come true for Abraham. He got the child of his dreams... Hagar and Ishmael, the nightmare of that situation has now been solved, and now he has made peace with his neighbors. Everything is going very well. This is the context into which God, God's command comes to him. It interrupts his life. Next, we see how God's command demands total surrender. Back to the text after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. 
put a pin in that location discussion. We'll come back to that. But for now, we're just noticing how God's command here demands total surrender. At a normal service, I might need to explain a lot of things these things. But if you're at a Good Friday service at Sojourn East, you probably know a lot of the beats of this story. You already know the part where Abraham and Sarah wanted a kid, couldn't have one, and God promised that Abraham would have descendants more numerous than the stars. Abraham would have descendants more numerous than the sand. You already know about this amazing provision that God had made to Abraham and Sarah when they were well past the age of having kids. So God's demand, his command here demands total surrender. I mean, to sacrifice his son, Isaac, means that Abraham is giving up years of trusting God. Day after day, night after night, difficult situation after difficult situation, he trusted God and now he has Isaac. And God's like, now sacrifice him. He's going to give up all of that. He's going to give up his present. The, The joy that he has, this Genesis 21 dream coming true moment in his life, he's going to give that up. And he's giving up his future. This idea of descendants more numerous than the stars, all of that will be lost by sacrificing Isaac. What is he, what is going on here? What, I mean, what is Abraham going to tell his neighbors? The neighbors ask, how was your vacation to those mountains of Moriah? And he says, I sacrificed my son there. What, a, what, a, what do you say to the, what do you say to the servants about what we need to take? What does Abraham tell Sarah? These questions are entirely speculation because Abraham never even asks them. He never even considers them. God's command interrupts Abraham's life. God's command demands total surrender, but God commands Abraham obeys. Let's look at this now, this Abraham's obedience here in verses 3 through 14, we've got three lessons to learn here, three characteristics that we can emulate to comply with God's command. First, we see in verse 3, Abraham obeyed eagerly, eagerly. Verse 3 describes the scene. It says, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son. He cut wood, he arose, he went to the place. This is an example of eager obedience. Abraham did not procrastinate. He obeyed. He he didn't hem or haw. He didn't vacillate or deliberate. He just obeyed. How How did he do it? Now, we seldom see examples like this in the Bible. God gave Gideon a command, and Gideon was like, well, could you make this fleece soggy first? Now, now make it dry. Gideon was procrastinating. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. And Jonah's like, I've got a different plan first. But here, and, and in both Gideon, Jonah, and then in our own lives, don't, don't we often miss an eagerness to obey God that we see with Abraham? God commanded Abraham obeyed eagerly. A second lesson we can learn from Abraham's obedience, verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Here we see that Abraham persevered in obedience. It's one thing to get off to a good start, but a good start means nothing without perseverance. Again, more stories from the Old Testament about people who don't persevere. Abraham demonstrates perseverance by traveling, the text says, for three days. After three days, his destination is still afar, but this doesn't stop Abraham. It doesn't even slow him down. How did he do it? Again, we seldom see this in the Old Testament. He perseveres in obedience. Noah got off to a great start with the ark, but then Uh, drunkenness and nakedness at the end. Solomon got off to a great start. Wisdom, temple building, a great coronation service, and then foreign reliance and too many wives. 
in our own lives, friends. It's not just Noah and Solomon, it's us too. We often miss the perseverance that Abraham had. What are we missing? Abraham obeyed eagerly. Abraham obeyed in, with perseverance. What are we missing? Well, what we are missing, friends, gets revealed in verse 5. And while this lesson appears third in the story of Abraham's obedience, in many ways, this is the foundational reality that we're talking about tonight. It motivates and shapes everything that we've seen in our story. Abraham obeyed with faith in substitution. Abraham obeyed with faith in substitution. Look at verse 5. Incredible. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Wow. I and the boy? Now, Abraham and Isaac are going to do three things. We will travel over there, we will worship, and then we will come again to you. Even before Abraham knew all the details of this story, he had faith in substitution. He was going to return with Isaac. Hebrews 11 verses 18 and 19 gives us a little sneak peek into what Abraham's thinking here. Verse 19 tells us that Abraham, quote, considered that God was able to even raise Isaac from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. This perspective changes everything. Faith in substitution changes everything. There's a wonderful prayer from the fourth century church father, Augustine, which says, praise to God, it says, give what you command and then command whatever you will. Lord, give me what you command and then ask whatever you want. Let me describe, well, this is a big perspective change for us. Let me just give you a time when my perspective changed dramatically in this. Uh, currently, I'm, I teach at a seminary, but uh, there was a time, believe it or not, that I had just graduated from college. I uh, just graduated from college, newly married, had saved up some money, and we had just bought a car. Uh, used is an understatement, very used, also an understatement. Last gasping breaths, more accurate for the car that we bought. Uh, blue smoke coming out the tailpipe, for those of you who know. As a piano player, you uh, don't have a lot of automotive expertise. Didn't see this coming. As I'm driving it one day, engine light comes on engine light comes on. Now, I know enough about cars to know that's no good. And my heart just gets very anxious. I'm not good at, at these sorts of things. I'm, I was very anxious about it. And maybe it'll turn off by itself. Didn't, didn't work. The next day, I'm driving my wife next to me in the passenger side. She's like, what's that light that's on? I'm like, oh, I'm not sure. She says, that's the engine light. I'm like, oh, is it? That's bad. I'm like, okay. So that Sunday, I was playing piano at the church, and a friend of mine, John Oliver, was playing bass. And John was the musician friend I knew that also was good at cars. John worked at a mechanic shop. And I asked John, um, you have to remember this is before YouTube told us how to solve stuff. But I asked John, John, how do, I shut off the, how do I shut off the engine light? I know there's a trick. You shut off the car. You like push something and kind of hold it. And then you start, but you have to hold it. for. I, just tell me how to shut this. You know how to, you work at a repair shop. Tell me, how do I shut this light off? It's making me very nervous. The queen is nervous. This is no good. I just need this light to go off. And my friend John Oliver got a little upset with me. He said, there was a reason that that light is on and that shutting it off did not solve my problem. He said, you got you to bring that car into a shop. He wanted me to bring the car into the shop Monday morning. He's like, how long has that been on? I'm like, just not that long, just several days. He's like, you need to bring that thing in tomorrow morning. And I, um, I didn't want to bring him the car. I did not want to bring him the car. I only wanted the light off. 
I, and just to be honest, it's because I had saved up enough money to buy the car. I didn't have money to get it fixed. And John said to me, you don't understand. I want you to bring the car by really early tomorrow morning at like 6 a.m. And then give me the keys and I'll tell the guys in the shop that it's my car. And they'll inspect it, figure out the whole thing and solve that problem and you won't pay a cent. And suddenly everything changed. Suddenly everything changed. I went from being very uninterested in the details of the car, all I want is that dumb light off, into like, wow. Do you know when you, when you turn it on, there's like a sound? And, and also, if you like let go of the, it kind of like drifts. Um, you know, so, so what, what changed? Uh, can you feel the difference here, friends? Once, I, I didn't want to know what was wrong because I thought I had to pay. Once I knew somebody else that was paying the bill, I wanted to get everything fixed. And my dumb story describes our lives. Very often, friends, we have a little light in our heart that feels guilty, a little light in our heart that says shame, a little light in our heart that says regret. And we kind of come to church and we're like, I just kind of need this little light that I have here just to go off so I can get back. I don't really want to know what's going on. And we avoid examining our hearts. We avoid confessing our sins. We avoid profound obedience because we think, I can't afford that. I can't pay for that. Give what you command, Augustine's prayer says, and then command whatever you will. Eager obedience, persevering obedience flows easily when we have faith in substitution. Friends, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. All of that regret, all of that guilt, all of that shame. Where do I get the courage for accountability? Well, think about it this way. You're just getting the car fixed. Somebody else has paid for it. Take it in. Take your, unburden your heart to Christ. Confess your sins. Friends, we have to make sure we get this order right. Jesus can never be our teacher Jesus can never be our example until he's first our substitute. Jesus is wise, Jesus is good, but his wisdom and his goodness can never benefit me until he is my substitute. Looking back at Genesis again in verse 7, just listen to Isaac's question. He says, behold, here is the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? This question echoes through our entire text. It echoes through the entire Old Testament. It's a question that Adam could have asked. God told Adam and Eve, on the day that you sin, you will die. And the day that they sinned, something died, but it wasn't them. It was a substitute. An animal died in their place, and they were given skins. It was a picture, a symbol. And if Adam had asked, here... Here is the picture and the symbol, but where is the lamb? Abraham would have answered, God will provide for himself the lamb. It's a question Moses could have asked. Moses saw at the Passover, he saw blood on doorposts. He saw a day of atonement where the high priest sprinkled blood on the altar. And Moses could have said, well, here is the door, here is the altar But where is the lamb? And if Abraham had been there, he would have said, God will provide for himself the lamb. David could have asked the same question. David murdered Uriah, stole his wife, and he confessed his sin. This is 2 Samuel 13. Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin. Like, Like put it away? Like there's a drawer? Like there's a box somewhere? Sin can't be ultimately put away. It must be 
paid for. Here is the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? And if Abraham were standing with Nathan and with David, he would say, God will provide for himself the lamb. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53, he described a suffering servant. We read some of these passages earlier tonight. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. What Isaiah's soul knew from the prophecy, his mind searched and inquired carefully. His eyes longed to see. Isaiah could ask, here is the prediction and the prophecy, but where is the lamb? And Abraham would have answered, God will provide for himself the lamb. One day, John the Baptist was baptizing people, and he saw his cousin, Jesus coming toward him. This is John 1, and John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Two of his disciples, it's probably Andrew and John, heard that, and they followed Jesus. They followed him throughout Judea, throughout Galilee, They followed him across the sea several times in boats. They heard him teach crowds. They saw him perform miracles. They watched him heal people. And on the last week of his life, they followed him into the city of Jerusalem. A city, I told you to put a pin in that location discussion, didn't I? A city that 2 Chronicles 3.1 tells us On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. 2 Chronicles 3.1 says that's the place where they built the temple. That's the place where Jerusalem was. And Jesus walked into, walked up Mount Moriah into Jerusalem. Abraham named it Mount Moriah. The Lord will provide as it was said to that day. On the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided Friends, this evening, we celebrate this reality. On the mountain of the Lord, it has been provided for us. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for this evening. And we thank you for this glorious truth. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Your word has helped us to see the sort of Savior that we need. We recognize that only God could pay the debt that we owe. We recognize that humanity should pay the debt that we owe. And so we are thankful afresh for the Lord Jesus, how he came to earth, how he lived a perfect life so that he could die as a substitute for us. And now our lives have meaning and purpose and freedom. Lord, set us free. Lord, set us free to obey you with eager hearts. Set us free to obey you with perseverance. Help us to recognize that Jesus has paid it all. Amen. Would you stand with us?
Heavenly Father, as we enter this dark night, do not forsake us. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Father, as the tombstone casts a shadow over the face of hope, be our light and our salvation. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Father, as we depart into the chaos and tragedy of the world, minister to us with a word of peace, a glimmer of hope, a voice of stillness. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Crush the head of the serpent and lift our heads to see your glory. Amen.
serpent's teeth and said.